today's lesson on exponential and logarithmic representations. We're going to be covering topics under the standards 2.5 AMC and the standards 3.1 AMC. And so we're also going to be covering topics in that study I alone so exponential and logarithmic representations. So if you're working in either of those two places, this is where you want to be to get a little bit extra help. Today's lesson, we're mainly Presented as graphs, tables, and word problems. And just make sure that as you're going along that you're taking really good notes so you have those three for back to and to study. And remember, you can always pause at the beginning of a question, work it out yourself, and then start watching the video so that you can self-correct yourself and get a hint on how well you are learning. So I'm so glad that you're here, and let's go ahead and look at some problems. The first thing we're going to look at is what a basic graph of an exponential function looks like. So over here, I have an exponential function. It starts out pretty flat and then starts to increase very rapidly. And to figure out where it is that it goes through the y-axis, that's going to be the number, the coefficient that's in front of. So the number that's in front of but not being raised to the x is where it's going to be going through the y. So here... In this problem, there's no number in front, it's just a 1, so that's why it goes through the y-axis at 1. And then you can have your different translations. A number being added or subtracted at the beginning or end, not with the x, is going to shift it up or down. And then a number being added or subtracted in the x, in the, in the exponent, is going to shift it right or left. So if it's, remember, if that's subtraction, it shifts it over to the right. And if it's addition, it's gonna shift it over to the left. It's backwards than what you think. And then lastly, if that B number is a fraction, what's being raised to the X is a fraction, that's actually gonna flip the fraction so that it's backwards from the original. So here it's asking me to choose the graph of the function below, and this is a pretty basic exponential function. So I know that the parent graph of an exponential function starts out flat and then rapidly starts to increase. Now there's no number in front of the two, so that means that this is, is going to go through the y-axis at one. And so right away I know I can get rid of r and q because they're going through at negative one instead of the one. And then there's no negative there to flip the exponential, so it's just going to be P, the original shape. So in number two here, I do have a number in front of the number that's being raised to the X. So that means this one is going to go through the Y axis at two. And so W, it's going through at four, so that's no good. X, it's going through at three, so that's no good y is going through at 2, and z is going through at 2. I know my original graph starts out flat and then it increases, and there's no negative in this equation to flip it, so that means it's going to stay the original shape, and so that means z is going to be my graph, which makes b my final answer. Now I'm going to look at my logarithmic function and the graph of that. Um, exponential and logarithmic functions are inverses of each other, so that means their graphs are going to be reflections along this y equals x line, in case that helps you out. This graph has a vertical asymptote, which means there's going to be a line going up and down that it get, the graph will get closer and closer and closer to, but it will never actually touch or cross it. And to find that vertical asymptote, it's going to be equal to x equals whatever number is being subtracted in the parentheses. So here, there's no number being subtracted in the parentheses. So x equals 0, this line here, which happens to be also the y-axis, is its vertical asymptote. And then you also have the, the typical shifts that this is your parent graph here. It starts out increasing very rapidly, and then tapers off and just gradually increases horizontally. Um, and so if you 
uh, subtract a number inside of the parentheses with x, that's going to shift it to the right. If you add a number in parentheses with the x, that's going to shift it to the left. And then if you add a number on the outside, that shifts it up. Subtract a number on the outside, that shifts it down. Your typical translations. So here is a logarithmic graph. And they want us to match the appropriate equation to this graph. So it has a vertical asymptote at x equals 2. So it's getting closer and closer and closer to that x equals 2 line, but it never actually touches it or crosses it. So that means I'm going to have a minus 2 in parentheses. So right away that can I can switch off that b. Now remember, my original graph looks something like that. So here I can see that my graph has been shifted over 2, which is why there's also a minus 2 in the parentheses with the x. It's been shifted 2 to the right, and but it's also been shifted up 3, so there's going to be a plus 3 at the end, so that means my answer here is D. So here's another one where we're matching graph to the equation, and right away I see that it has a vertical asymptote at minus 5. So that means it's getting closer and closer to the minus 5, but never actually crossing it. So that means in my equation, I'm going to have an x plus 5 as part of my logarithmic equation. So because it's always the, it's an, the vertical asymptote is x equals negative 5, and so it's going to be the opposite in the parentheses. So I have an x plus 5. The only one here that has an x plus 5, and you have to use parentheses, is a. So that makes a my answer. So here it asks, what is the vertical asymptote of this graph? Well, remember to find the vertical asymptote, it's just x equals the opposite of what's in parentheses. So I have a minus 8 in parentheses here, so it's going to be x equals positive 8, and that makes my final answer b. So now we're looking at an exponential equation because it has a number raised to a power of x, and it wants us to find the intercept for the y-intercept and the asymptote for this equation. Well, to find the y-intercept, the y-intercept is always the point 0 and then some number for y. So that means to find any y-intercept, I plug 0 in for x. So I'm going to replace f of x with y, and then I'm going to replace x with 0. So I'm just substituting 0 in for x, and then I'm going to go ahead and calculate that. So 0 plus 3 is 3, so I have 4 to the cubed plus 4. 4 cubed is 64 plus 4 is 68. So that means that my y-intercept is going to be 0, 68. So that leaves a and d as my answers. To get the asymptote of an exponential function, it's just the number that's being added and subtracted at the end. And the asymptote of an exponential function is horizontal, so it's always y equals that number that's being added or subtracted at the end. So that means my answer here is going to be c, because it has the asymptote of y equals 4. So which of the following equations corresponds to the table of values below? Well, here they give us the four equations and they give us a table. So you're just going to see which one of these is if I plug in all of these x values, give me the correct y value. So if I'm looking at a, I'm going to take 2 to the 0 power, because that's my first x, minus 9, and see if that gives me my first y number, negative 8. So anything raised to the 0 power is always 1, and 1 minus 9 is negative 8. So it checks out for that one. And then you're going to do the same. You're going to take for the next one. So your next x value is 1. So you're going to take 2 to the first power minus 9, which is 2 minus 9, which is negative 7. So it checks out for the second column also. And then you're going to repeat. You're going to have 2 squared minus 9, substituting in that x value of 2. 2 squared is 4. 4 minus 9 is negative 5. So it checks out for that one too. And you're going to repeat for each of these columns until you see if they all are correct. And if you do that for letter A, 
A is going to hold true for all of them. So that makes A your answer. Now, I want to show you one that if you had done B, which if you're taking the EOI or a test, I'd recommend going through all of them because on the EOI you have as much time as you need just to make sure you didn't make a mistake on the first one and to rule them out. So in B, if I substitute in 0 for X and see right that gives me negative 8, which is what this first column says should happen. 0 squared is 0 and 0 minus 9 is negative 9, which isn't negative 8. So B couldn't have been an answer. And so you could go through each of C and D and you also rule them out that way. And so that makes my final answer A. So this question says, Sam decided to open a savings account. The monthly balance of his account is shown in the table below. Which of the following functions would be the best model of the data above? So here we are looking at we have constant, exponential, linear, and quadratic. Well, if it was a constant function, that would mean that the balance stayed the same no matter what month it was, which doesn't happen, so it can't be A. To be an exponential function, that would mean that when I take the ratio between the balances, that they would stay the same. So that means that when I take the ratio of 81 over 52, over 75, 25. So I'm just taking balance of month two over the balance of month one, and I divide that, that gives me 108. And if I do that the same, I take the balance of month three over the balance of month two. So 88, 31 over 81, 52, that also gives me 108, 1.08. And then I would continue to do that for the other months also. And so when I set those ratios up and do the division, they also give me a ratio of 1.08. And so since all of those ratios match, that means that this is going to be an exponential function. So here we're talking about the principal P is invested for T years at an annual rate R in the compounded N times per year, then the amount of A or the ending balance is given by the formula below. So this is a real life exponential function. So you know that you're depositing $3,400 in a bank account paying 7% compounded quarterly, then what is the amount will be in the bank account at the end of five years? So here I just need to correctly identify which numbers are which variable. So here, this is my principal because that's what I'm beginning with. This is percent is going to be my rate. And then it's compounded quarterly. So that means four times a year. So that's going to make my N4. And then I'm doing it for T years. So my t here is going to be 5. And once I've identified those variables correctly, then it's just a matter of substituting the numbers into the formula. So I'm going to have 3,400 times 1 plus, and then my rate is 7%, which as a decimal is 0 0.07 over 4. And that's raised to the 4 times 5 power. And so 4 times 5, that's just 20. So this is raised to the 20 power. And then I'm going to go ahead and work inside of my parentheses. And so that's going to be 3,400 is still up front. And then 1 plus 0 0.07 divided by 4 is 1.0175. And when I raise that to the 20th power, that gives me 1.41478. And that still times the 3,400. And when I do that multiplication, and I do some rounding, I get 4,810 and 25 cents, since we're talking about money here, which makes my final answer here B. Thank you for joining us today and I hope you learned something new.